Hey, what's up? I'm Channel Pup Fanboy Supervillain. And today we are talking about the newest Batman animated show, Batman Cape Crusader, on Amazon Prime. Produced by Bruce Tim, Matt Reeves, and JJ Abrams. I'm gonna be reviewing it. I'm gonna get pretty spoilery, so this is probably one to watch after you've seen the show, if you haven't already. And if you haven't seen it already, absolutely make a point of seeing it. This is absolutely one worth checking out. I can tell it's going to be quite divisive, but I think everybody needs to form their own opinion on this one. But also, just, hey, you're looking pretty fly. Why not subscribe? Okay, the rhyme doesn't work, but I meant what I said. And the Patreon link is in the description below. It is hugely appreciated. So, Batman Cape Crusader was first announced in 2021 for an HBO Max release. However, HBO Max decided to drop it. And so the show spent a couple of years looking for a distributor until finally landing on Amazon Prime in 2023. And now it's finally being released. And I just gotta say, I am really glad they found a distributor for this project. This happened at a time when Warner Bros. Discovery were axing projects left and right and just taking a lot of particularly animated projects outside the back of the shed and just shooting them in the head. They are a very tricky company to even try to support. But I am really glad that Batman Cape Crusader found a home, and especially Amazon Prime as well, because unlike HBO Max, Amazon Prime doesn't really have a region lock on it. Or it might have one, but Amazon Prime is accessible in pretty much all of the world from what I understand, so it's not gonna be like HBO Max where I need to have a VPN to even access it. So okay, good, great, excellent. Fantastic. It's fallen right into my lap. Now let's actually talk about Batman Cape Crusader, because what we have here is a very interesting project in that it stands alone, but I think it's even better enjoyed after you've seen Batman the Animated Series. Because what we have here is not a continuation of Batman the Animated Series or an evolution of it like, say, the new Batman Adventures was. This is a brand new show, a brand new continuity with a brand new voice cast, except it has a lot of the DNA of Batman the Animated Series in there. It kind of wants to evoke the feeling of watching Batman the Animated Series. And it kind of doubles down on a lot of the things that Batman the Animated Series did. That noir-esque tone, they've doubled down on that here. Gotham looking like a 1940s inspired sort of no time is once again doubled down upon here. Everything is very analog and that's something I love. I want to see that with more superhero projects. I've seen some folks saying that this does take place in the 1940s, but I mean, I thought that to be the case as well when I saw the trailer, but there's not really anything to explicitly say that this is that time period. In fact, there's a lot of things that would kind of contradict that as well. This show has quite a diverse cast of characters in positions of power. We've got relationships that go beyond kind of the heteronormative. And that's not to say these things didn't exist in the 1940s, but they certainly weren't commonplace and where they were, there would usually come some very cruel and unusual consequences. So I definitely don't think that this is explicitly the 1940s. There's nothing to really say it is explicitly the 1940s. I think it is just that kind of no time kind of art deco look that Batman the Animated Series had. Which I'm going to start referring to as BTAS just for the sake of brevity. And Batman the Animated Series gave us some pretty unique reimaginings of Batman villains that we can kind of see as definitive versions these days. This series doubles down on that, going a little further with its reimaginings of different Batman characters. And of course, you do have Bruce Timm returning for the overall aesthetic and look and vibe of this show. And that was something that I was actually a little concerned about, because it is once again Bruce Timm returning, but no Paul Dini. And, okay, Bruce Timm is a fantastic artist, but... The thing is, in recent years, we've had Bruce Timm returning to Batman projects without Paul Dini, and they haven't been very good. It kind of goes to show that it was that duo that really made BTAS work, because we had projects like Batman the Killing Joke and Batman and Harley Quinn, and these were just, like, quite literally the writer's barely disguised fetish. Really only bearing a resemblance to the great storytelling that we had in BTAS, rather than actually being that good storytelling. 
Who'd have thought bringing back an artist but not the writer would result in some varied results? Fortunately, Bruce Tim isn't writing or directing this one, he's purely producing it, and I believe he played a big role in kind of the overall aesthetic of this. The writer this time is Ed Brubaker, hope I'm pronouncing that right, and he's worked on various different Batman comics, and he's done a good job here. What I can safely say overall for Batman Caped Crusader is, is that it is a brand new depiction of the Batman universe with some pretty drastic reimaginings of different characters, but it does evoke the same overall vibes of Batman the Animated Series. The general tone is very similar to Batman the Animated Series. Some of the storytelling choices and some of the structure, very similar to BTAS. Like, it definitely evokes the feeling of watching BTAS as if it's a brand new show. And in a lot of ways, that carries over to the new voice cast as well. We've got Hamish Linklater as Bruce Wayne, aka the Batman. And he does an excellent job in this role. He does sound at face value quite similar to Kevin Conroy, but he has some of his own nuances that he brings to the table. I think it's because while his voice is different and his performance is quite different, he's overall doing the same things that Kevin Conroy did, just his own versions of those individual elements. Uh, one example being kind of the differences between Bruce Wayne's voice and Batman's voice and kind of how calm and collected Batman sounds. But what's funny is we do also have some other Batman voice actors in here. Diedrich Bader, who played Batman in Batman the Brave and the Bold and the Harley Quinn TV series, who is a great Batman voice, by the way, provides the voice for Harvey Dent. Roger Craig Smith, who played Batman in Batman Arkham Origins, Batman Arkham Shadow, Batman Unlimited, provides the voice for Jim Corrigan. But you've also got John DiMaggio, who played the Joker in Batman Under the Red Hood, playing Harvey Bullock. Jeff Bennett, who played the Joker in Batman the Brave and the Bold, plays Jack Elman. Gray Delisle, who has voiced a whole slew of different characters in the Batman mythos, but is probably best known as Catwoman in Batman Arkham City and Arkham Knight, plays Julie Madison. Tom Kenny, who is probably best known as SpongeBob, but he's played a whole lot of other characters, Spyro, etc., gives the voice to Firebug. You've got Yuri Lowenthal, you know, Spider-Man. He plays Detective Cohen. James Arnold Taylor as Marcus Driver. And I think Eric Morgan Stewart gave a very different take on Commissioner Gordon that works really well. Crystal Joy Brown was also excellent as Barbara Gordon. So the voice cast across the board are excellent. Gotta say, hats off to them. This may not be a continuation of Batman the Animated Series, but it is kind of a successor to it. And so they all had pretty big shoes to fill overall, but they all did an excellent job. They all knocked it out of the park. Now this is a 10 episode season and there will be a season two. It's already in production. And there is an overarching story, but there's also kind of like mini sub stories within that. You've got your kind of villain of the week format, but there is that overarching story over it. And the focus in this show is less on Batman and more on Gotham City. This show is a 13 plus and it was stated that this would be a bit more adult than Batman the Animated Series was. That they were doing stories here that they would like to have done for Batman the Animated Series, but couldn't due to the fact that that show did still ultimately need to be catered towards kids, despite being a very mature show in its own right. And my immediate fear was, you know, it's a Bruce Timm thing, so it's gonna be more sex, right? Or maybe, you know, there's just gonna be a whole slew of swear words, but no, no, that's not what they actually did here. The angle at which this is a more mature show is because it's generally more political. It's more about kind of politics in Gotham. You've got Harvey Dent's mayoral campaign, you've got corruption, you've got bent cops, and the pacing is generally slower than that of BTAS. It results in this show feeling like it has a much larger scale. It feels kind of more like prestige drama that happens to be animated rather than a Saturday morning cartoon. But this show isn't kind of trying to replace BTAS as the definitive Batman show. This serves as much more of a B-side. This is much more kind of a, a remix of general Batman mythology through kind of a lens that is like a more intense version of the BTAS lens, if that makes sense. I would generally describe the different characters in this as remixes of those characters. Some more radical than others. I'd say Batman himself is pretty much everything you'd expect Batman to be. He is that world's greatest detective, but he is in his first week of being Batman here. Although that isn't explicitly stated in the show, that's just something that was mentioned behind the scenes. But there is a lot of Matt Reeves DNA here. 
this Batman is in quite a number of ways fairly reminiscent of the Batman from The Batman 2022, not 2003. In that he's that very methodical, very sort of slow and steady detective. And while you do get to see Batman kick some ass in this, the primary focus is the detective stuff, much like in The Batman 2022. The dynamic between him and Alfred is, once again, very similar to that of The Batman 2022, in that he's very distant from Alfred, even going so far as to kind of refer to him as Pennyworth. There's very little warmth between Bruce Wayne and Alfred. But after Alfred has a near-death experience, Bruce Wayne kind of learns to recognize more of Alfred's sentimental value. And then by the end of the show, we see that bond start to kind of form and solidify. But one area where this is very different to the Batman 2022 is the dichotomy between Bruce Wayne and Batman. This was something that BTAS really established the most, I think, was that Bruce Wayne is very much the mask that Batman wears. It's the old cliche chestnut, but it is true. Batman is who Bruce Wayne really is, but then when he's out making public appearances, he's kind of this ditzy, air-headed billionaire who only really cares about babes and public relations and alcoholic beverages. Now, of course, the sister show to BTAS was the new Batman Adventures, which kind of had this arc of Bruce Wayne kind of going down a dark place, and we saw that, you know, Bruce Wayne and Batman started to meld a bit more, you know, that there was much less of that public persona and then, of course, The Batman 2022, there wasn't any public persona, he hasn't developed that yet. Whereas here, that public persona is much further explored than it is in Batman the Animated Series, even. There is an episode where Bruce Wayne goes to therapy, and Harleen Quinzel is his therapist, and she can't get past that facade, but they, they really do explore that there is much more going on below the surface of Bruce Wayne. And Harleen Quinzel kind of knows that, but she also knows that Bruce Wayne is not letting on. But as well as that, Batman isn't always the central focus of the show. You'll have episodes that focus more on Barbara Gordon or Rene Montoya. And I've seen some folks complaining that there's not enough Batman here, but at the same time, like, Batman the Animated Series did have episodes that didn't focus on Batman and would focus on, say, Batgirl or Robin or Nightwing. Even then, though, I wouldn't say that Batman has a lack of screen time. He's in this quite a lot. He's just not always the central protagonist. However, he does probably have the bigger arc of the heroic characters in this show. So even though Batman is very early on in his career, Commissioner Gordon is fully established as the police commissioner. He's not Captain Gordon or Detective Gordon, like in a lot of other sort of early days Batman stories. He is firmly the commissioner. And Batman doesn't really have much of a rapport with him. However, one thing that remains a constant is that Commissioner Gordon is very much a uh, we're going to do this by the book kind of way. Someone that doesn't waver on his principles. And with that, he's also quite old fashioned. You know, you could have like a, a mugger who's stolen some bread for his family or something and Commissioner Gordon's got to take him in. He's doing it by the book. But then there's Barbara Gordon, and this is where things get really interesting, is that Barbara Gordon is a lawyer in this show. She's not the little girl daughter of Commissioner Gordon, who wants to be just like her daddy. She is a fully established woman in a fully established career. And what's interesting is that she kind of butts heads quite a bit with Commissioner Gordon in kind of the overall values that the two share. Commissioner Gordon is much more kind of, again, old school by the book, while Barbara Gordon is more about more kind of forward-thinking reform methods. She doesn't believe that Gotham's criminal underworld should just be thrown in the slammer. She believes they should be treated with care. We should understand why they do the things that they do, look after them, and send them back out into the world as better people. And that reflects on Batman as well, how he gradually grows more compassionate towards his adversaries as he kind of learns to understand that there is more going on behind the surface, just like there is with himself and his Bruce Wayne persona. So you don't have your conventional sort of heroes versus villains, heroes win, villains lose kind of story here. Like Batman the Animated Series, there's more shades of grey going on here, but it's much more at the forefront this time. How these different characters on different ends of the moral spectrum interact and influence with each other is at the absolute forefront of this story. So let's talk about the villains, because that is where things get really unique with Batman Cape Crusader. This is the place where I think things are going to get a bit more divisive. 
Now, you have some villains that kind of serve as your sort of villain of the week character, but like Batman the Animated Series and the new Batman Adventures, you do have some villains that are kind of forming their stories in the background as part of the overall arc. So, okay, first up, and this one has been quite a talking point, uh, is the Penguin. A lot of the usual suspects have been very pissed off about this one. I'm gonna say this, if it's a change that you're not keen on, fair enough. But I think when you make it like a political discussion, it gets a little silly. The Penguin is a woman this time. Oswald Cobblepot is now Oswalda Cobblepot. And I do find the name quite funny. And a lot of folks are decrying this as woke penguin. This is, you know, the woke has gotten to the penguin. They've made her progressive. <laughs> Not really. I, I mean, when you look at the way the villains are done in this show, the penguin turning into a woman is kind of the least radical thing here. But no, they haven't just turned her into a woman for the sake of it. This penguin is a mother to her very own crime family. And I think that's a good idea because it is in service of the penguin's trademark callousness. Everyone obviously has their own different experiences with their parents. Sometimes they don't make the cut, but everybody knows what a mother is supposed to be. Someone who loves you unconditionally. Someone you can always rely on. Someone who puts their children before themselves. And Mother Cobblepot is the opposite of that. She's someone that is quite happily to stick her own son in a box and sell him down the river. She will kill her own. And that's something I like, is that they've taken that penguin character trait of that callousness, that lack of loyalty to anyone, even blood relatives, and made that the entire crux of the character this time. Looked at the most extreme place they could kind of take that. So I thought this was a really cool idea. It also kind of makes you realize that the penguin's gender has never really been integral to the character of the penguin. In fact, same goes for a lot of Batman villains. These characters are very adaptable. Now being completely real, I don't think anyone's gonna look at this version of the penguin and say, oh, that's my favorite version of the penguin. And I think the same goes for a lot of the villains in this, but I, I think that is by design. These are very radically different takes on these characters. Penguin is the first of the sort of villain of the week villains, and I think she's a good one to kind of introduce us to the fact that, yeah, these are not the versions of the characters that we already know, these are brand new. They're going to be going to some unique places with them. And then the next one we get is Clayface. And you would be forgiven for mistaking this ghoul for Scarecrow because he certainly bears a resemblance. But there's a lot more focus on the sort of Basil Carlo side of the character. We do explore Clayface's origins in a non-linear fashion quite similar to Heart of Ice back in Batman the Animated Series. Basil Carlo is very much kind of a Bela Lugosi-esque actor who kind of got cast in a lot more sort of ghoulish roles than he really wanted. He didn't get the roles that he wanted to play. He could have been a megastar but his appearance got in the way of that. But one of his makeup artists promised him that he could turn things around with a new prosthetic surgery, this crack new procedure, but it gives his face a clay-like consistency. And so he can kind of take on different roles, but he decides to take on a brand new role in life, not for a movie, as kind of this villain, and he deliberately hams things up. Now, Clayface this time is not this big physical threat. He's not this clay monster. Especially design-wise, he's a bit more akin to Golden Age Clayface. But his overall shtick is more similar to that of the Chameleon as well, in that he can take on different appearances. He even fakes his own death using the body of his former makeup artist who did the procedure on him. Well, Clayface did the procedure back on his makeup artist in an act of revenge, killed him, and then disguised his makeup artist as himself. Well, isn't that groovy? In episode three, we are introduced to Harleen Quinzel, and she's a psychiatrist for Gotham's wealthy elite. And Bruce Wayne becomes one of her clients after he assaults a journalist at a museum who makes a comment about his mother. And it's through those therapeutic sessions that we do see a bit of Batman's origins. And it's kind of similar to how Batman Mask of the Phantasm uses a framing device for the Batman origin story, all without actually showing the death of his parents. However, Harleen Quinzel is not the villain of this episode. That's instead Catwoman. And when I first saw Catwoman in the trailers, I was like, they haven't really done much with Catwoman. Catwoman just seems to be archetypical Catwoman. What's interesting is it's her motivations and her background that have really changed here, while the Catwoman persona is much more as you would understand it to be. Selina Kyle is not this impoverished woman. She is one of Gotham's wealthy elite. And there's quite a lot of parallels between her and Batman in that, yes, yeah, she has this very public face as a member of Gotham's elite, 
but she also has her alter ego, which is directly inspired by Batman, even down to having her own Catmobile. That and like Batman has his butler Alfred, she has her maid. And like how Batman is very cold and dismissing of Alfred, she's very cold and dismissing of her maid. So why does she steal? Why is she a cat burglar? Well, it's because she can. She can do that. Why? Because Harvey Dent will back her up in court. As one of Gotham's wealthy elite, she can get away with pretty much anything, and so she does. Batman's way of stopping her is to get photographic evidence of her doing this, to the point where it cannot possibly be denied, and then yeah, she is guilty. But that's okay, she's rich enough to be bailed out easy enough, and, you know, with her possessions and everything she's stolen, she can easily get back all of that bail money and then some. Except, her maid is her downfall. So Selina owes her maid a lot of back payments, and so her maid decides to sell everything, take the money, and leave. Leaving Selina with nothing. Now, on one hand, this is a good standalone story for Catwoman. It's a very interesting reimagining. On the other, this could also serve as an origin for a more classic archetypical Catwoman in a later season, but we'll see. I don't think we've seen the last of her, one way or another. Then in episode 4, we're introduced to Firebug, who is often in comics mistaken for Firefly, and they do make a little bit of a joke of this. Now, I'm going to be honest, I thought he was a Firefly reinvention as well until I looked it up. Look, I'm a Batman fan, but I don't know everything there is to know about every single era of Batman, and that will show. But Firebug isn't really the villain of this episode. The villains would be Detective Harvey Bullock and Arnold Flass. So Mayor Jessup has assembled a task force to take down the Batman with Commissioner Gordon heading the operation. And we do get some really cool sequences of this assault on the Batman from the GCPD's perspective, and we see just kind of how powerful Batman really is. But Bullock and Flask go rogue with their very own idea, to lure Batman in. They break Firebug out of the GCPD lockup and bait him into going rogue and burning down the east side apartment block, which was Commissioner Gordon's old beat. They are willing to destroy homes and have people get killed just so that they can lure out the Batman and fulfill this task for Mayor Jessup. And they use Firebug as a pawn, and we see that this guy isn't so much evil so much as he is just very, very sick and twisted, believing that all people are embers wanting to return to the flame. Once Firebug's job is done, Bullock kills him. When Commissioner Gordon meets Batman for the first time, he sees that Batman is saving the different children from the apartment block. And because this is Gordon's old beat, he kind of knows the building a lot better than Batman does, so they work together to save the kids. There is one little contrivance though, and that, that is that Batman has no way of knowing that the police officers in this building will actually survive, but we don't see him help them at all. We don't even see any intention of it. They happen to get out, but Batman doesn't know that. So that is effectively Batman leaving people for dead, but hey, hey. <laughs> this show does have its share of contrived moments, which I will talk about a bit later. In the end, Batman gets away and Bullock and Flass win, as Mayor Jessup puts them in charge of the task force because Bullock was seen taking Firebug down. Then in episode 5, big surprise to me, King Tut makes an appearance after getting rid of all of his fortunes. It all transpires that he was one of Dr. Quinzel's clients, and we discover that there's a bit more to Quinzel than there seems to be. She is living a double life, something that gets in the way of her budding relationship with Rene Montoya, rendering these two star-crossed lovers, and that's another reason why this couldn't take place in the 1940s, because that would not be allowed. So yes, we know a few things here. Dr. Quinzel is a psychiatrist for Gotham's wealthy elite, we also know that there's a lot of corruption in Gotham City, especially among the wealthy elite. So Dr. Quinzel abuses her power as a psychiatrist and uses it to manipulate Gotham's wealthy elite into their own cruel and unusual punishments, trapping them in what she calls her playpen, where she kind of tortures and enslaves these guys. Which I think is a cool idea, because we've taken this aspect of Harleen Quinzel, that she is a psychiatrist, and built upon that for her evil persona. There's no relation or ties to the Joker. She does wear the Jester outfit, kind of as a means of saying, like, you know, the Kings don't run Gotham anymore, the Jester does. There's even a little reference to her little catchphrase of calling the Joker Puddin', in that, you know, she says that one of the guys cannot 
to have any pudding until he's eaten his beans. And they make a real point of her talking about this pudding. Again, it's a remix. But again, we've got a bit of that Matt Reeves DNA in here, in that, like, there's a lot of focus on corruption in Gotham City, and we've got a character here that's kind of manipulating those rich and powerful who abuse their power into their own punishments, a lot like what the Riddler did in The Batman 2022. Now, you might be thinking, like, this is a more mature show, it's a darker show, so it's surely more grounded, but that's actually not the case at all, as we meet Gentleman Ghost, the ghost of the late James Craddock, a charlatan of the past. And the whole episode I was thinking, how is it going to transpire that he's not really a ghost, and Batman is thinking the same. Turns out he is actually literally just a ghost. And so Batman, Alfred, and Papa Midnight work together to take down Gentleman Ghost. And honestly, I was so surprised that he was an actual ghost. I really thought that they were going to have a big reveal that he's not a ghost. But no, this show just straight up said, no, we're gonna do the supernatural stuff. We can, we can do supernatural stuff. And yeah, it's in this episode, we do see kind of Batman's relationship with Alfred start to change. There is an instance where Lucius Fox kind of scolds Bruce Wayne saying that he should treat his help better. And then at the end of this episode, Gentleman Ghost briefly possesses Alfred and uh, Batman thinks he's going to lose him. And we see in this moment that Batman is genuinely scared of losing Alfred. Then in the next episode, we've got a brief appearance from Deadshot at the very start, who appears to be trying to assassinate Commissioner Gordon. But upon botching that, a team of hitmen led by Onomatopoeia all descend on Gotham to take Gordon down. And so after a lot of intense persuasion from Barbara, Detective Cohen, and Jim Corrigan, Commissioner Gordon finally agrees to go to a safe house but it's in order to keep his own neighborhood safe rather than himself, because he genuinely believes that he should be there protecting Gotham. Okay, that's some good character development for Jim Gordon. But there was a twist I really didn't see coming, and that's that they're actually hunting down Barbara Gordon. And then a further twist I didn't see coming was that Jim Corrigan was working for Onomatopoeia and tried to kill Barbara Gordon. Which is insane because Corrigan has been a recurring protagonist throughout the series. I genuinely, genuinely didn't see this coming. In episode 8, as part of his mayoral campaign, Harvey Dent brings the carnival to town. And Leslie Tompkins' orphanage all go in attendance, they get their pictures taken with Harvey Dent, but there's something sinister going on behind the scenes at this carnival, as the vampire Natalia Knight, aka Nocturne, has lost control of her vampire powers and is sucking all the energy out of the different orphans that she's hunting down. And as Bruce Wayne is trying to find these orphans, he ends up getting jumped by different carnies, including Killer Croc, who plays a small role in this episode. Now, Nocturne was originally intended to appear in the new Batman Adventures all the way back, but she gets to appear now. And she puts up quite a fight against Batman, clearly able to manipulate him too. Now, there are some fun little Easter eggs with the names of these different orphans, which may just be little references or maybe allusions to a future Bat family, but we do get the names of all of the orphans that get kidnapped in this episode. You've got Dickie, aka Dick Grayson. You've got Jace, aka Jason Todd. You've got Steffi, aka Stephanie Brown. And you've got Carrie Kelly. And I'm kind of hoping that this is just a little nod, a little reference to the Bat family, and that they're not actually going to tell us that all of the Robins and Batgirl went to the same orphanage and are all the same age. Well, more or less anyway. A cute little reference I'm fine with, but I, just, I don't know about Batman going to an orphanage and just being like, I'm here to talk to you about the Bat Family Initiative. <laughs> And then we have Harvey Dent, who is a recurring character. As I mentioned, like, Harvey Dent's mayoral campaign is the big overarching story of this season. And with him being the district attorney and with Barbara Gordon being a lawyer, we do see those two kind of butt heads over their values. We see that Harvey Dent is willing to pervert the course of justice for the sake of his own public image, and that is what he's all about, is that public image, public perceptions of him. He greatly cares about what people think of him. But beneath that surface, again, surface being a big theme in this show, Harvey Dent's mayoral campaign is funded primarily by mob boss Rupert Thorne. Basically, in court, 
Harvey Dent does everything in his power to ensure that Rupert Thorne's boys get let off, in exchange for Rupert Thorne's funding and support. But Harvey Dent kind of notices that he is behind in the opinion polls, and that the carnival event that he put on didn't get him the donations that he needed, so he decides to change strategy, and not let off one of Thorne's boys. This results in Harvey Dent being the victim of an acid attack in a public bathroom by one of Rupert Thorne's guys, disfiguring half of his face. Now, naturally, if half of your face did become horrifically disfigured, you probably would be quite insecure about that. That would be quite a lot to go through. But Harvey Dent has spent this entire season, his entire mayoral campaign, obsessed with his image. And now half of his face is disfigured. So yeah, it does get to him, and it does result in that kind of split personality, Two-Face persona that we all know and love. Two-Face as a character is actually not too different from that classic Two-Face that we all know. But it's what they do with him that is quite subversive. Because he kind of becomes a better person after becoming Two-Face. He's sicker, absolutely. And he's a lot more publicly, openly angry with the world. But at the same time, he's not this smarmy guy that beneath the surface is accepting funding from the mob. Now he's going out on a search for justice. He's hunting down these mobsters and uh, enacting his very own lethal form of justice, killing these mobsters. But interestingly, despite the setup, Harvey Dent doesn't end up being the villain of the finale. So in the finale, it's an all-out war in Gotham. Bullock and Flass are out to bring Harvey Dent in to Rupert Thorne, but Barbara Gordon serves as Harvey Dent's lawyer. Just as every bent cop descends upon the city to find him, Barbara, Jim, Montoya, and Batman work together to protect Harvey Dent in the pursuit of his reformation. And in the end, Harvey Dent is shot dead by Flass, protecting Barbara Gordon. We've got a story here where Batman isn't fighting Two-Face, he's protecting him from the GCPD, and what an incredible subversion that is. Now, of course, Harvey was a friend to Bruce. He didn't initially know what was going on behind the surface. And so Bruce is kind of in mourning, quite similar to what happened with the Phantasm in Batman Mask of the Phantasm. And like that movie, Alfred kind of comforts Batman in that situation. And it's there where Batman finally starts referring to him as Alfred instead of Pennyworth, cementing the bond between the two of them. But Rupert Thorne is still out there, and Batman makes sure that Rupert Thorne knows that there's a Batman out there, and he's coming for him. And what an incredible way to end the season with this shot that goes biblically hard. What's crazy is that the main villain of Batman the Cape Crusader ends up being the corrupt GCPD, all working under Rupert Thorne. We've got the introduction of Two-Face, but he's someone that Batman is working to protect. We also see a little partnership form between Batman and Barbara Gordon, and not in the way that you might be fearing right now. There was a reviewer that kind of used those fears to their advantage in the headline. But no, don't worry, there's no Bruce Sex Barbara here. It's just that Barbara Gordon is taking on more kind of the role that Jim Gordon would have taken in most other Batman continuities. So that is the first season of Batman the Cape Crusader. And I gotta say, hats off, they all knocked it out of the park on this one. It is a really engaging B-side to Batman the Animated Series and an absolutely worthy successor. I think if you see Batman the Animated Series as kind of the definitive Batman show, Cape Crusader isn't going to change that, and I don't think Cape Crusader is trying to. Because Cape Crusader is so drastically different to the source material, it ends up being more of a remix than an adaptation like BTAS was. And I think to that end, this show is perfect for fans of BTAS. Because, yes, they could have simply made another season of BTAS or New Batman Adventures. But instead, they gave us a show that takes everything that made those shows great, but does something brand new with it. There isn't that familiarity there. It, it kind of feels like watching Batman the Animated Series for the very first time. It feels like meeting a lot of these villains for the very first time because they are such drastically reworked versions of these villains. But what I like about these is that they've reconstructed these characters from the ground up, usually taking something about their personality from the comic character and building from there. For example, Harley Quinn. You know, she's not this accomplice to the Joker in an abusive situation. They've looked at Harleen Quinzel and said, okay, she's a psychiatrist, what can we build on top of that? 
they've looked at Catwoman as a cat burglar and looked at her kind of dynamic with Batman and they've built on top of that. But what's built there is something brand new and I think that is how you do a remix. I've also got to say the orchestral score by Frederick Weidman is very good. I, I don't necessarily love it as much as I do the soundtrack for BTAS by Shirley Walker. I definitely was able to pick out a few more themes there in that season, but um, in, in this show anyway, I, I, I will say Batman's theme itself will get stuck in your head. Now I have said that the show is not without its contrivances. In the first episode, for example, there's a moment where Batman is in the Penguin's warehouse, which is kind of above the sea, and rather than hide behind any of the crates or boxes, he decides to dive straight into the water. There's an instance where Batman kind of pistol whips some goons with the Batmobile, and that could easily kill them. Batman discovers that the corpse of Basil Carlo is a fake and made of clay by simply poking it. Would no one at the morgue have noticed that already? There is that instance that I mentioned with the fire and the police officers. And then in the Gentleman Ghost episode, I did kind of have to wonder, was Batman maybe playing a bit fast and loose with his secret identity by bringing Alfred along and being in the Batsuit at the same time? Is this not something that maybe Bruce Wayne could have dealt with? And then there's, okay, there's one thing here that's, it's not bad by any objective means, but it is kind of like, it's on the shoulders of a giant here. Is that if they wanted this to kind of be the successor to Batman the Animated Series, I kind of wish they could have done something a bit more with the opening credits. The opening credits are good, they do show off that sort of noir vibe, they take some shots from the episodes and kind of uh, give them a slightly different shading style and make them black and white, and that's cool, it, it does set the tone. But Batman the Animated Series had one of the most iconic opening credits of all time because it was effectively a little vignette, it was effectively a short story, silent, with Batman, and it kind of makes this really grand impression. I'm not saying they should have done the exact same thing, but I would have liked if we could have gotten that sort of like, mini vignette sort of opening, with the same level of energy as Batman the Animated Series had. Again, that's not me saying what's here is bad, it's just when you're on the shoulders of giants, it is kind of... It's very much that sort of streaming service original opening credits, where it's like, hey, we're just gonna run some stuff and put put some titles over it, you know, we're not necessarily out to tell a story here. That's really the extent of my criticisms, I guess. There are things here that you're gonna roll with or you're not, but I am gonna say it is worth approaching this with an open mind because I really enjoyed it. It, it took everything that I loved about Batman the Animated Series and put it in a fresh new project that felt, you know, it gave me the feeling of watching that original Batman the Animated Series for the first time, and I think that is a feeling I value very highly. And for that, I really love this show. Is it better than Batman the Animated Series? Well, it, it does different things. Its focus is in different areas. I think overall I do prefer Batman the Animated Series still, and that mainly comes from that kind of comic book sensibility, kind of, you know, I, I like the villains that we've got in Batman the Animated Series. And you know, there was a part of me that was like, oh, this is the best Batman series since Batman the Animated Series, but at the same time, it's not like we haven't had banger Batman animated shows since Batman the Animated Series. I mean, Batman the Brave and the Bold, for example, is an incredible show. Kind of the polar opposite to Batman the Animated Series, you know, looking at the lighter side of Batman, very much a celebration of the Silver Age. Maybe these reviews will be better if I don't keep trying to say it's the best this, that, or the other. Maybe if I just say this is another great entry to Batman's animated tenure, that, that's more than enough. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention is before the credits of the final episode, you do get a little tease as to one of the villains that's going to be in the next season of the show. And it's the Joker, I think. Y you do see people with laughing toxin and you see the guy injecting it, and then you see a pair of eyes and he doesn't really look or sound like the Joker as I know or understand him. But uh, again, they do reinvent these things. So yeah, it looks like we're getting the Joker. I gotta admit, I would absolutely welcome the prospect of a version of Batman where we don't actually ever meet the Joker. And then we have Batman Telltale, and in the first season we had, you know, Two-Face and Penguin as the main villains, and then of course uh, you had the Child of Arkham. And then season two focused on the Joker. With Gotham, you know, you had Penguin, Riddler, Fish, Mooney, and you did get a little Joker cameo, but then season two, Joker had a big role. We've had The Batman, a movie without the Joker that seems to set up the Joker for a future installment. And then we've got this, and listen, I really do love the Joker, don't get me wrong, but at the same time, I do think there are very exciting things that can be done without the Joker. I feel like, you know, the centralized versions should have the Joker. I feel like, you know, the DCU Batman 
whenever that comes, should have his own Joker. But I, I don't think we need every version of Batman to fight the Joker all the time, you know? I was honestly just excited to see characters like Two-Face getting the spotlight here. But on a whole, that, that's one thing or another. I'm, I'm looking forward to it nonetheless. Um, and yeah, this was a really great first season. Really looking forward to the second, see what they have to offer. But what do you guys think? Have you seen Batman Cape Crusader? Did you enjoy it? Did you enjoy my review of it? Comment below, discuss, and as always, if you enjoyed this video and you want to see more like it, be sure to hit subscribe, hit the like button, and in the description below is the link to my Patreon page, where for as little as $1 a month, you can get your name in the credits of these videos, with a special shout out going to the patrons in the $5 and above tier. We have Cho Henshin, KB, RT0, Cal X, Hypes, Sad Goku, Dare Danny, SSS06, Kale Bennett, Ken K just wants to joke about Helium 2. Good news, everyone! They found Helium in the Iron Range. Your long search is over. Cirrus the Skeptic, Biotin. Oh no, I've used up all of the Helium. What am I meant to do now? And Vera Wild. Thank you, good folks, so much for your generosity and your Helium jokes. And to those of you at home, Thank you so much for watching, and have a great day. Now get out of here.